Hi, good evening to everybody here. It's a real privilege to be here in your company. We don't take it for granted. I want to just express my profound thanks to Gavin. Gavin, thank you so, so very much for bringing this about so swiftly. Definitely deserves a round of applause. And I also want to distinguish my great and powerful colleague, Alan Langer, our international coordinator, who's standing over here. Alan, thank you for everything that you've done to bring this about. It wouldn't be possible without you. And in absence, Rosita Panini, who's the president of our organization. We're very, very grateful. We're particularly grateful because we meet at a time where the Jewish people find themselves embattled, and that embattlement centers in no small part around the state of Israel. And so we are grateful to feel that we're among friends. As I said, we do not take it for granted, and you should know that you have our profound, profound appreciation. And uh, when you back the State of Israel, you're backing a sure, sure thing. You are making the right policy decisions. And we applaud you, each and every one of you, for so doing so. Thank you indeed. Remember always that uh, the Jewish people have gone through a hell of a ride over the course of history. But if you, if you do give the Jewish people about half a chance in this world, which is all they've ever had, they will go out and they will build you an Israel. And it's absolutely glorious and worthy of being celebrated. And nothing is more humbling than to be able to bring somebody who's dedicated their lives in service of the country, the State of Israel, who's given the best of his or her talent to the State of Israel. And Colonel Eli Baron, as you heard during the kind words of introduction, is the immediate past Deputy Military Advocate General of the Israel Defense Forces. I'm going to interview him, ask him some questions, some of the answers to which I know, some of the answers to which I will not know. And then afterwards we're going to throw it over to you to push and cajole and educate us by way of your questions. I think I'll interview you for 20, 25 minutes or, or something in that facility. It should be an open, candid conversation, especially when we bounce it over to you for your questions. And so with that, I want to just begin. Ah, there's one other person who I don't know if he's here or not, but this event was connected by an individual named William DeWolf. I don't know, is William here? I know he was expecting to be here, but he is somebody to whom I definitely want to extend a profound debt and note of gratitude. So, Colonel Eli, uh, or as they call you in the South, Eli, uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. And I think what I'd really like to begin by asking you is, uh, tell us exactly why in combat situations, in military situations, why is it that the Military Advocate General's Corps of the Israel Defense Forces has shot to prominence, and why is it perhaps needed now more than ever before? Okay, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Um, I, I can't really explain that, but I immediately after entering this, uh, this beautiful room and uh, the feeling that I'm uh, among friends. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I want to thank uh, also our host uh, for organizing that and, and Benjamin for being such a dear friend for so many years and uh, for bringing, bringing me uh, to all these places, giving me the privilege to speak with so many uh, different audiences in this country. I really appreciate everything that you do. And I really um, encourage all of you to support uh, uh, Benjamin and his uh, organization for everything that they do. Regarding your question, I, I had the privilege to serve for so many years at the uh, legal core of the, of the IDF, the Military Advocate General's Core, and I had the privilege to be the, the second in command of this core. And I think the importance of, of, uh, the, of this body of, uh, of lawyers, uh, just as it is in, in the JAG, the American JAG Corps, is the ability or the, um, the, the idea that a, a, democr a, a democratic nation uh, will always be bound by the rule of law. The military of those uh, governments, the militaries of those governments, who are always subordinate to the governments themselves, will always be uh, pursuing the rule of law in their uh, operations. Uh, international law has always been um, something that uh, all, all, both our countries uh, have respected immensely. I think uh, after 9-11, you could see uh, many lawyers flock law schools because they realized that the, the new war on terrorism, uh, the, the, the changing world uh, after 9-11 uh, will, will uh, require more international lawyers. 
I think this is a part of uh, what we see in the world today. In the past two decades, we see more and more international organizations uh, dedicating more of their operations to international law. That also put Israel in, in, in maybe more in the focus of many of these uh, organizations. Israel has always been uh, under the microscope for whatever they did. It's okay. Uh, I wish they could, uh, you know, distribute the, the the global attention to to all the, the places that need this attention in the, with the same standards. But uh, knowing what we do and how much we strive to uh, meet the uh, requirements of, of the law and exceed them, uh, I always felt very comfortable with that. So our lawyers um, are just uh, part of that, being the spearhead of, of uh, pursuing international law, making sure that uh, everything is, what we do is uh, um, meeting the law and uh, having this dialogue with, with, uh, with friends among other countries and also the dialogue with, with organizations that might be more uh, critical to us. So it's interesting that you use the phrase being under the microscope because the state of Israel, especially on the issue of the laws of armed conflict, is actually the laboratory of thought on customary law. And the reason for that is because Ladies and gentlemen, while there are many, many democratic states that are prosecuting asymmetrical warfare against enemies overseas, they of course do that thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away from the homeland. But the state of Israel is prosecuting asymmetrical warfare among enemies or against enemies who are about 45 minutes drive away from the capital city. So that means that the application of the law, as regularly and often as unfortunately it has to be, in the dynamic of the state of Israel is looked at as a learning example and experience and you are actually someone who has taken the lessons of that application to positively inclined audiences and adversarial audiences. Tell us a bit about how you've encountered other militaries and what they've said about some of the tactics and techniques that the IDF has used and then maybe we can get into some of the real-time battlefield experiences. That, that's a great question. I think one of the, um, I would say, advantages of, of uh, fighting in such a small nation is the fact, and, and the fact that we do, we do not have, uh, the IDF has never been an expeditionary force. We always fight uh, to defend our borders and that's it. We, we never send soldiers to, to, to any other uh, places to fight uh, around the world. Um, the advantage of that is that we know our adversaries very well. We know. Uh, the patterns of life in the Palestinian society, the, the Lebanese society, etc., uh, etc., et and that allowed us uh, over the, the, the course of years to, to be able to, uh, I would say, um, recruit all this knowledge that we have about our, our adversaries, our, our, about the societies, uh, for the benefits of, uh, of international law for. for uh, for instance, implementing international law in a, in a way which would be, allow us to mitigate uh, civilian harm in ways in which it will not be possible in other places. Um, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. The IDF is the only military on earth that will call uh, people to their cell phones before impending attacks. We will locate their, the, the locations of people's uh, cell phones. We will call them, we will tell them, you're in the vicinity of, of a target that's about uh, to be targeted, please evacuate yourself. We will use uh, text messages pin pinpointing specific people uh, in, in, in those places. Uh, we will use special tactics that uh, uh, when, whenever people are not willing to, to evacuate from a specific target, we have a procedure called knock on the roof. Uh, um, sending a low munitions projectile to a corner of the roof of the house, it will not cause any damage. It, it will only shake the house strongly, and it's usually very persuasive in getting them out of the uh, out of the house. Okay, so it sounds funny, but the, the, this technique saved the lives of thousands of people. But whenever I meet uh, uh, colleagues from from U.S. military, they you know they will uh, tell me, well, "What the hell are you doing? Why do you use this practice? Why would you raise the bar so high? There is no way we can ever meet this uh, these standards." Okay, we will never call people to their cell phones. We don't know how to do it. If we're fighting it in Iraq or Afghanistan, we don't have people cell phones, we will not do that. We will not, you know, we, we, if we told someone to leave the place, he didn't, that's, that's his fault. So, but I think it's important to have all these um, um, tools 
in, in, in your arsenal of, of tools that you use in order to mitigate uh, civilian harm whenever you can. And this is uh, what we've been doing. Uh, Israel has been at the, at the forefront of these efforts. We're, we're leading in many ways. Uh, we've had uh, so many meetings with the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, that, that uh, actually uh, praised us for, for all these efforts. And this dialogue with, with colleagues around the world is, is very, uh, has always been uh, very um, uh, interesting in the way of the reactions of the group. There's such a huge gap between what you see in the media and what you hear from, from experts in other countries about uh, what, how much they appreciate your efforts and, and what you do uh, in, this, uh, in this context. So let, let's go a little bit to some practical applications that you, you do. First of all, the IDF actively educates officers about international law and about the law of armed conflict, not the simple soldier, and I don't mean that in a derogatory sense, but at a particular level and rank, they start to educate them on that. I'd like you to tell us, let's take one example from the ground, one from the air. Give us an example of a commander in the battlefield during a recent campaign that people can attach themselves to and contextualize here, where they have an operation, they have an objective, they have a target, and there's this exchange with the MAC Corps in real time, as I understand it. Tell us about their questions, tell us about your response, and then tell us about how sometimes they actually reject the legal advice. Uh, but not necessarily for the reasons that people might assume. And then after that, I'll come to, to aerial attacks. Okay, so we do have um, mandatory legal education for, for commanders in the IDF, just as the commanders in the, in the US uh, Army uh, are bound by, by to, to go through uh, some legal courses. And this is very important because you want your commanders to uh, be educated about the legal ob obligations uh, during military operations. They will always be able to consult a lawyer, but obviously we do not send lawyers in the tanks or in the cockpits. You don't need that, even though I, I, I've seen many very uh, beautiful caricatures of, of lawyers in, in, you know, on the shoulder of the commanders, let's attack, pull back. Uh, we don't have that. Um, but we do have lawyers and, and we do have all these legal courses that uh, the commanders go through, uh, as they progress through the ranks, they will get more in-depth legal uh, training uh, that will instruct them as to their uh, legal obligations. Uh, and all of them know, know their, uh, um, their duties, their, their obligations, their, their requirements of the international law very well. But they also have, um, we have a bank of 150 lawyers called the Operational Law Apparatus, uh, lawyers that are being deployed with the commanders on the battlefield to allow them to get real-time legal advice and we have a 24-7 uh, legal war rooms with experts of international law in, in all niches of international law to allow uh, all commanders to get uh, real-time legal advice. Um, and the dialogue between the, the commanders and, and lawyers is, is very interesting because I would say that the, the law sets the, the minimum threshold for every um, military operation. But there's always a gap between this minimum threshold and the threshold that you meet when you speak with commanders of, of their morals, of their ethic, eth military ethics. And in many cases, you will have, uh, you will discuss a specific target, you will discuss the, uh, whether this target uh, attacking is proportional or not. You always have these numbers, you can see uh, a lot about it in the, in the media, whether you, um, attack a senior military operative of, of uh, Hamas or Hezbollah, and, and he's surrounded by some civilians. What will be the, the, the number of civilians that will um, allow the attack to be uh, lawful, proportional, etc.? And in many cases, you know, I had uh, talks with, with even the, the head of the Israeli Air Force. He will say, I will tell him, if, if it's a prominent figure, the military advantage that you get from its attack is, is significant. Um, two civilians that will die with him, you know, as, as regret, regretful as it is, uh, will not make the attack uh, disproportionate. And he will tell me, you know, but if I know in advance that there are civilians near him, killing them is murder. 
that's not, not part of the of, of what will I, I will approve uh, to do to, for my pilots to do. And so I'll tell them well, that's not the law. The law allows you to kill civilians. And this is part of uh, the, the legal collateral damage. So it was always interesting to me uh, to see that. He will tell me, listen, at the end of the day, I have to go back to my wife and kids. I don't want to go back to them. And this is the, the, the part of Israel being, you know, he, he has a shift, he, he finish, finishes his shift after midnight, 30 minutes and he's back at home. He says, I will not go back to my wife and kids knowing I, I killed civilians today. So this is uh, an interesting dialogue that I had thousands of times over the years with many uh, commanders. The law uh, allows you to do many things that people will just uh, uh, decide not to do eventually because of, of things that are intrinsic to, to, to their uh, upbringing, to their education. Yeah, so, so very, very interesting point there. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how familiar all of you are with the workings of the Israel Defense Forces, but it operates a, a draft system. So when people graduate from high school, they're drafted into the IDF. In the case of men, it's for three years. In the case of women, it's for two years. Most of them don't go in with any ambition to necessarily become a soldier, certainly not a career officer. The vast majority do not want that. But they have a different ambition, and that ambition is that they want to navigate their way through these two or three years of dilemmas, and then return to being civilians of good conscience. And the moment they're actually not able to do that, the moment that they go home and masses of conscripted soldiers are not able to assign themselves a clear conscience, is the same moment that you'll see Israeli society disintegrate from within. And we're very, very pleased to be spared that dynamic because Soldiers will see war in Israel. Soldiers will be deployed into the battlefield. So it's very important that they do have this moral code that oftentimes supersedes the legal. Uh, I, I was going to ask you about the aerial attacks, but you wove a bit about that into your answer, and I think you've dealt with that. This is an audience that is engaged in policy discussion. And one of the things that happens when it comes to supporting the state of Israel is people will make allegations on the news, and they'll say, well, 500 people in the opposition were killed, only two Israelis were killed, it's disproportionate. And in actual fact, the principle of proportionality is not in any way, shape, or form constructed to, according to that definition. So just for everybody here, and then I'll maybe take two more questions from you, can you explain the principle of proportionality in, in legal terms, not media terms, but legal terms? Okay, so in, in legal terms, Whenever a commander, a military commander, has to carry out an attack, he has to uh, take into considerations into, into mind. The first one will be what will be the military advantage that I will gain from this attack. The second one will, will, uh, will be what, what will be the collateral damage from the attack to civilian, to civilian uh, objects, etc. And he can only carry out the attack as long as the uh, collateral damage is not excessive comparing to the uh, uh, military advantage. So this is a case-by-case -case examination. You will not be looking at the overall uh, result of the, the whole operation, the whole uh, war. You look at each and every attack separately, individually. <coughs> now we do that for thousands of, of, uh, of attacks in each operation. Operation Protective Edge 2014, I was uh, in charge of the legal advice in this operation. Uh, we had more than 6,000 aerial strikes. Each one of them had to go through a process in which you look into the intelligence, uh, you realize whether it is a military target or not, because for some of the uh, targets that you will look into, you eventually you decide that this is not a military uh, target. And then you look at all the aspects that allows you to, to minimize the collateral damage. Okay, you have experts in the room, not only lawyers, physicists, engineers, all sorts of experts will tell you what would be the, the right time and day to, to attack, okay? If, if there's a, a school near the target, maybe we should do it at night time when there are no students around. Uh, what would be the right uh, angle to strike? Will this fragmentation go uh, away from adjacent buildings or towards them? What will be the right munitions? Etc. 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 So many considerations. Now, in, in the media, oftentimes what I see is, is what you said. It's like uh, they look at the, the, at the tallies of the, the body counts and they would say in, in Operation Protective Edge there were 2,000 uh, casualties on the Palestinian side, only 70-something 
casualties on the Israeli side, hence Israel must have been disproportionate. Well, this is egregious. Because if you look at the, at the modus operandi of both sides, well, what, what we see in Hamas is, is a clear modus operandi to embed uh, themselves within the Palestinian uh, population. All of the operations of Hamas are, are from uh, heavily uh, populated areas. The uh, head command and control uh, center of, of Hamas is at the basement of the biggest hospital in Gaza, of, of Shifa Hospital, the uh, hospital that Israel has built. Um, you see that in their military manuals, always operate within uh, civilians. We know the sensitivities of the idea. This is how we operate. Um, you see it, uh, all the launchings of the rockets from Gaza are always, you have those videos, always from very densely populated uh, areas. So of course you will have uh, casualties there. The, their operatives are never, never dressed in uniform during operations. They are always dressed as civilians. They always they have directives for the, for instance, the Ministry of the Interior in Gaza is not allowed to disclose the identities of the dead. Okay, they are always uh, uh, portrayed as, as civilians. All of them. We know for sure that among uh, 2,000 casualties, 1,000 were militants. We know their name. We know their identities. We have their, even their pictures uh, with with the, the uniform and, and weapons of, of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad from from you know, from before the operation. But this is not part of what the uh, media will see. Whereas in, in Israel, um, we have uh, the Iron Dome missile defense system. Uh, we have the Home Front Command uh, protecting people. A person will not be able to build his house in Israel unless he has a shelter in his house. You will not get a permit to build a house without having a shelter inside your house to be able to save yourselves and, uh, and, and your kids. So. Of course, you will have less casualties on, on one side uh, when this is the situation. So, and, and explaining that, I, you know, that was very short. It, explaining that to the media is almost impossible during hostilities. And this is why you always have the, the, the PR effect of, of these wars, which is negative uh, towards democracies. So my last two questions, as, as someone who's a, a combat veteran, Second Lebanon War, I hadn't really heard of the Mag Corps. By Operation Pillar of Defense, I certainly had heard of the Mag Corps. And by Operation Protective Edge, I think the Mag Corps was very, very prominent in Israel's strategic planning and response in the aftermath of the war. Who's coming after soldiers like me, officers, senior officers? Who are you fending off in the Mag Corps from this legal assault and bombardment against the actions of the IDF? And if you could just briefly outline that because I want to move on to my final question and, and try and push you a little bit. Well, there, there are, I, I alluded to that before, there are many international organizations uh, that look uh, after the operations of, of the IDF. There are many uh, NGOs that do that, Israeli NGOs, international NGOs, uh, Palestinian NGOs. I, I appreciate the, the work of all of these groups as long as they have uh, legitimate standards or, or uh, standards that they use in other parts of the world. It's not always uh, the case. Uh, and these groups will look at the, the operations of whatever we do and, and publish their reports. And we have now uh, 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 the uh, prosecutor of the, uh, the International Criminal Court in The Hague who uh, just announced uh, the, the court, the pre-trial chamber, that uh, she has the uh, intention to follow a, a full investigation to, uh, to uh, the operations in uh, the situation in, in Palestine, the way uh, she phrases that. Uh, so you have all these groups, and you want to be sure that your soldiers are, are protected by ways of, first of all, of, of uh, complying with international law. This is the first measure you use. You educate them in order to make sure that this is what they do, that when their actions will be examined, uh, they will be uh, um, assessed and, and uh, uh, evaluated and appraised as, as uh, such that uh, comply with the international law. Uh, and you have these, uh, our own mechanisms in place to examine what they do. We have investigation units within the military police, within the MAG Corps, etc., to make sure that this is what we do. And if we do find violations of the law, we have an obligation to uh, prosecute these individuals. 
uh, in order to ensure our public that all the, the rest of the soldiers were operating within the framework of the law. So my last question, actually, I want you to pivot a bit to the United States. So Qasem Soleimani is no longer of this earth. But you know, a really, really unfortunate thing and outgrowth of that is this debate that I think is absolutely repellent about whether or not it's justified, whether or not it's legal. We hear it, for example, coming from the United Kingdom. We've heard it from various sides of the aisle here in the United States. I understand that Soleimani was in the crosshairs of the Israelis for years. Tell us why, if it is your view, why this was the right thing to do, why it can be justified. And maybe you can mix in a bit of an Israeli experience in a similar vein as well, if you would. Okay, so may I start with, you know, with taking off my, my lawyer hat? <laughs> I, I did not shed tears for, the, for this individual, okay? And, and why? Because you said you, you talked about that. Um, Israel has been pursuing him for so many years because he was involved in the deaths of tens of thousands of people, innocent people throughout the Middle East. It's not only Americans, it's not only Israelis around the world, but uh, first and foremost Muslims in the Middle East, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen, you name it, in Iran, okay? Now, the legality of, of this uh, attack, I think the, it was, the US was the, the American uh, government was on firm legal ground in conducting this uh, operation. Uh, it was uh, imminent uh, that uh, this guy was plotting uh, more attacks against uh, the US. He was doing so for so many years. He was uh, planning to do so again. Uh, the attack, some people uh, were addressing the, the fact that, uh, or uh, criticizing the fact that the attack uh, was on Iraqi soil and maybe there has been a violation of the Iraqi sovereignty. Uh, I think that Iraq was both unwilling and unable uh, to deal with him. He was operating freely in Iraq for so many years. And this is why the American government did not need the consent of the uh, Iraqi government. But I should remind that the American soldiers are operating on Iraqi soil by the consent and the invitation of the Iraqi uh, government. Um, I've been reading intelligence about him for many, many years, and I can assure you that the world is a much better and much safer place uh, without him. Thank you.